Association of Earlham School of Religion. And while I'm thinking of it, I just want to say a big thank you to Brown for organizing these lovely sessions that allow us to be together, think together, pray together. It's just really a precious gift. So thank you, Brown. And Lauren, I'm just so but I'm so excited to uh, welcome you and to, to really uh, appreciate your, your speaking to us this evening and sharing what's on your heart. Um, I, I'm very fond of Lauren and, and uh, yeah, really, really just grateful you're here. So let me tell you a little bit more about her. Lauren Brownlee is a member of Bethesda Friends Meeting in, in uh, Baltimore, about said Britain, BYM, which is Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> She's currently Deputy General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. She leads FCNL's governance, community, and culture departments and helps to steward FCNL's shared anti-racism, anti-bias, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion commitments. Lauren previously served on FCNL's General Committee and Friends General Conference's Central Committee, and she currently serves as the co-clerk of the Quaker Coalition for Uprooting Racism Steering Committee, and also another co-clerk um, of the American Friends Service Committee's Community Equity and Justice Board Committee. Lauren earned her BA in Classical Civilization and Greek. Now she's not giving the talk in Greek tonight, but yeah, that would be a challenge. From Wesley College and her MA in Global International and Comparative History from Georgetown University. She's also a graduate of the Friends Council on Education's Institute for Engaging Leadership in Friends Schools. Now she worked in several Friends Schools she worked at her, as an alumnus, she worked at Sidwell Friends School also. Um, and then <clears throat> she uh, has also worked at, was the upper school head at Carolina Friends School. And before that was director of social action at Stone Ridge School of the Sacred Heart. So uh, Lauren brings so much, a wealth of experience to us. And we're just really very excited and looking forward to hearing what you can share with us and and then a wonderful opportunity to engage and ask questions. So thank you, Lauren. Let us move into a period of worship and Lauren will speak out of the silence. Well, I thank you for being here, friends, and I thank you, Brown and Gretchen, um, for hosting me. And Brown, it's been lovely to work with you and Gretchen. Um, I met this summer at the FGC gathering where Gretchen gave one of the best plenary presentations I've experienced around pulling together threads from the week um, and being clear about how much we gain by being present to each other. Um, and I loved that and it will forever stick with me. So it is great to be 
back in community with you, Gretchen. Um, and I have slides that I will share. I'm going to remember to share my sound because there is one video. Perfect. Oh, not that share. <laughs> Slideshow. Um, and just a reminder that the um, name of this talk is Quaker Principles and Practices and Service to Racial Justice. And I will start by giving a little bit of a different introduction to myself and my history with uh, Quakers. Uh, and that first picture on the left uh, comes from my early days when I started at Sidwell Friends School um, in kindergarten. And my family was not really familiar with Quakers, but my mother had worked at the Washington Post and a lot of um, people who work at the Washington Post send their children to Sidwell Friends School. And so when she was asking about what schools were recommended, um, that was what they suggested. And so that was my whole family's introduction to um, Quakerism was my time as a student at Sidwell. And then that top picture in the middle um, was from my time as principal at Carolina Friends School. My favorite color is purple. So this picture is from my birthday when the staff dressed up in purple in celebration. And I love pictures like this because um, to me, they always represent the community that we form in all sorts of Quaker contexts um, and the various ways that we can care for each other. Um, underneath that one is my FCNL community. Um, this was our staff picture from our staff retreat last year. You will um, notice if you see any FCNL staff pictures in any context that we are almost always um, doing peace signs. We are trying to spread peace however we can, including by being photogenic on behalf of peace. Um, and then my picture on the right is Bethesda Friends Meeting, um, which I started going to um, actually in the year 2000 um, when I was a junior in high school and went to the Quaker Youth Leadership Conference um, sort of randomly. I had been going to Sidwell all of these years and had not felt especially connected to the Quaker principles or practices um, from that experience. But my advisor said, you know, Lauren, this Quaker Youth Leadership Conference um, brings students together from a range of Quaker schools. And I think you would appreciate the experience. I think it would be something that um, you would plug into well. And so I went just based on her um, guidance in that way. And what I found was that as the theme that year was on the testimonies and as I was listening and engaging in presentations, I thought, oh, these are my values. <laughs> and I started going to Bethesda Friends Meeting with my friend's mother on Sundays, um, starting then. And then um, started going again in 2007 in a more regular way when I was teaching at Sidwell at that point. Um, and felt really clear um, then that that was my spiritual community and have been uh, going regularly ever since um, and became a member a couple years later after doing a, a lot of good investment in community. Um, and it's been a really important part of my life, not only Bethesda, but the Quaker um, identity and Quaker communities um, that I get to engage in across the board. And the other thing that is important to me is love. I am someone who identifies as a lover of love. And this slide actually comes, you'll see it has a little bit of a different background. And it's because it comes from a presentation that I did last week. Uh, we had a PowerPoint party within the FCNL staff. 
Um, and we all, it was for Valentine's Day and we all had to, or didn't have to, but were invited to offer a three minute PowerPoint on something that we love. And mine was on why I love love. And um, I picked these pictures as times that I have connected my love with my activism um, and that my desire to be the change that I wish to see in the world, um, to be a beloved community builder is something that has been a really important part of my both faith journey and my professional journey, um, both as an educator um, for 17 years and then in these last couple of years um, as an FCNL staff member. Love is a part of Baltimore Yearly Meetings, Faith and Practice, um, in ways that I really appreciate. Uh, Gretchen described how I was Director of Social Action at Stonebridge School of the Sacred Heart, which is a Catholic school, um, and the order of nuns that runs it are the Sacred Heart nuns, and in addition to um, being a Quaker, I am also a lay member of this order of nuns where they really love that <laughs> I am a Quaker. Um, but part of why I joined that group is because the order of nuns, um, the Sacred Heart nuns, are so connected to this idea of witnessing to love, um, that their, their whole vision is that they can both speak to and demonstrate through their actions, the love of God in the world. Um, and that has been an important part of my spirituality. And I didn't realize how well articulated that was within my Quaker faith until I was just helping to co-lead um, an intro se session about Quakerism to um, newcomers at, at Bethesda Friends Meeting, and we were looking at some of these opening pieces of Baltimore Yearly Meetings, Faith and Practice, um, and the way that it resonated with me um, now in a way that I had not read it that closely for it to resonate before was really powerful, and these are two of the pieces that really stood out to me to that point. Love, the outworking of the divine spirit is the most potent influence that can be applied in human affairs. And this application of love to the whole of life is seen by the Society of Friends as the core of the Christian gospel. The eminence of God implies that all persons are children of the divine and brothers and sisters, one of another. All have the capacity to discern spiritual truth and to hold direct communion with God. And we seek to serve others in love to share our gifts and resources, to reach out to those in need, both friends and strangers, and to witness in the world our shared experience of the infinite love of God. And to me, these two sentiments together are what have spoken to me about um, my Quaker faith. And I had not recognized before that it was as well articulated by Baltimore Yearly Meeting as this, but this is certainly what has spoken to me especially as I am someone who feels like my core life calling is building a beloved community. And I often use this quote from Dr. King to help define what I mean by beloved community. And he said, the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption, the end is the creation of beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of friends. I'll sit with that for a moment. And when I think of that, I think of this touchstone quote for me from George Fox, 
that we know so well, be patterns, be examples in all countries, places, islands, nations, wherever you go, so that your carriage and life may preach among all sorts of people and to them. Then you will come to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of God in everyone. And in many uh, presentation that I make in Quaker context, I often say this really to me is the heart of my Quaker faith. Um, this quote right here, the idea of being a pattern and an example of letting my life preach, um, of walking cheerfully over the world, not because the world is cheerful, but because I get to choose what my orientation is and to try to walk with love. Um, and my choice to walk with love um, is something that I feel called to through my Quaker faith. Um, and then I think to me and to many of us, essentially is answering that of God in everyone. And I also like to point out that it doesn't say recognizing that somewhere down deep, there is that of God in everyone, that you don't need to see it. You can just imagine that somewhere it's in there. Um, but that to answer that of God in everyone requires us to be active participants in that, to um, be taking that active step um, of recognizing what that of God could look like in the other person and to be connecting to them through that. And because I will just say, um, because this is such an important touchstone and because it references being patterns um, as something that we're focused on, I am gonna come back to this um, slide a few times throughout the presentation to help us to um, connect to that idea of how are we seeing examples and being examples and patterns. One of the ways when we think about racial um, justice that we think about being patterns um, are these racial equity principles. Um, and these are a set of ideas that have guided many people in their racial equity work. Um, it's a common resource in the kinds of circles that are that are thinking deeply about racial equity. And so when I think about the importance of the kinds of patterns um, that build beloved community, these racial equity principles are among those kinds of patterns that we wanna focus on. Know yourself, work on all three levels. So the individual level, the interpersonal level, the societal level, think and act collectively. So we're not thinking just of ourselves, but how, what kind of impact we are having and doing that um, in community and communion with others. Be accountable to principles and people, honor and build power on the margins, transparency, set explicit goals, use an organizing mind. Remember that we all have circles of influence. Take risks, learn from mistakes, seek connection and choose love over fear. So these are the kinds of racial equity principles that when we're talking about racial justice, these are the kinds of things that help support that racial justice. So outside of a Quaker context, these are touch points for people. And so what a lot of my talk um, is gonna be about today is how Quaker principles connect to these kinds of principles. And the first thing that I'm gonna ask us to focus on, and this, I guess I will just mention, I have the link here to, this is from white supremacy culture, Dot info, which is um, a touchpoint resource that is not universally um, appreciated. And there's, there's some controversy about it because it's definitely um, misused sometimes. And it is also a resource that was collaboratively created and not all of the collaborators always get enough credit um, for it. But it is a really useful touchstone resource for people who are trying to think about 
um, what are the patterns of ways that do not help us to build racial equity and that those can be considered a part of white supremacy culture. And that white supremacy culture really just means what is the culture that has maintained the status quo for all of these years? Um, and that it's not about people who are actively hating, but it's about the ways that we all have um, grown up and through a society that was built on principles that put some people above other people. Um, and so you'll see other references to this white supremacy culture, language um, and resource. Uh, but the thing that is most key for me when I think about uh, what I'm taking away from that is this list of um, racial equity principles. And I, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this know yourself one before we get into um, some of the racial justice work, I think it's important for Quakers to also reflect um, on what some of the patterns are that we might see in our own context. So my colleague and friend, Alicia McBride, and I wrote an article for Friends Journal called Countercultural Leadership for the World We Seek. And it was looking at these um, patterns of white supremacy culture that you see on the left here and the patterns of um, antidotes or racial equity principles that can combat um, those white supremacy culture characteristics. And we thought about how we feel like the characteristics of racial equity are connected to a kind of countercultural leadership that we see Quakers embracing and that we want to continue to encourage Quakers to embrace. And I'll name that my role at FCNL began as Associate General Secretary of Community and Culture, and that Bridget Moikes, our General Secretary, uh, one of her first acts as general secretary was creating the community and culture department and the associate general secretary of community and culture role with the idea that our Quaker identity and our anti-racism, anti-bias, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work are connected. That when we become more diverse, we become more authentic to our Quaker um, commitments and that when we are um, having integrity around our Quaker commitments, that we also then become more diverse. Um, and so Bridget said, there needs to be a department that holds those two core ideas of FCNL together. And that is the department that I have now led for about a year and a half that is now the governance community and culture department. And we think about the governance of the organization and how that fits into all of this work as well. But in this article, Countercultural Leadership for the World We Seek, we talked about where we're seeing the work being done and where, where we're calling for the work to be done. Um, and we used the example of um, our priorities process at FCNL. So FCNL, um, for each Congress, so every two years, we have a priorities process through with Quakers throughout the country where we ask, what would you like us to be focusing on for the next two years? Um, and it is a process that Alicia and I um, say is really representative of how Quaker process um, and principles can help us to work toward racial justice because these the priorities process is saying we all, all of our voices matter in this. We could say lobbyists, you decide what to lobby on, but that wouldn't be the organization that we are. That we as Quakers believe in the wisdom of the whole. And so we want to hear all of the voices. And then there is a spirit-led process um, through our policy committee where they take all of those responses from people all over the country and they in a spirit of worship, listen for what they're hearing in that. And they then determine those priorities. Um, and so there's a lot about that that can be wonderful. And then we also say it, it's not wonderful on its own. We have to be working on the process to be a just and inclusive and diverse process. 
And so in the article, we suggest um, a kind of a set of queries that in this example would be the kind of queries that could lead us toward a equitable process, a process that that held that commitment to anti-racism, anti-bias, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in mind. Um, and so the kinds of queries that we're suggesting in this context um, are when faced with differences, do we try to avoid silence or explain them away in order to have a semblance of unity? Or can we sit with the discomfort of uncertainty and allow divine guidance to surface? Can we listen deeply to those with less currency in white supremacy culture and see those contributions as having weight at least equal to those who can more easily navigate that culture's requirements? How do we both seek unity among the friends gathered and listen to perspectives that might be missing from our gathering? Hmm. To what extent do we embrace the potential of our Quaker faith and practice to act as antidotes to the culture in which we exist? And to what extent do we allow white supremacy culture to warp our Quaker practices instead? So this is a kind of example that we give in the article about how do we maximize what the strengths are of the principles and practices that we hold as Quakers in order to work toward that beloved community. And right after Alicia and I wrote that article um, through the Quaker Coalition for Uprooting Racism, um, I helped to craft these principles for addressing racial wounding and racial justice in Quaker communities. And this is a picture of some of the leaders of the Quaker Coalition for Uprooting Racism. Um, and QCUR, as it is called, is a um, coalition that is made up of Pendle Hill, Quaker Voluntary Service, Friends General Conference, FCNL, American Friends Service Committee um, and Friends Council on Education. So we all work together to think about what can we do to help um, address racial equity within Quaker spaces. Um, and that we as organizations have access to many Quakers um, across the country and across the world. And so what are we doing to use that power for good? And one of the things that we did this last summer was create this guide that has both, what are some of the patterns of racial wounding that can happen in Quaker communities? And then what are some of the antidotes to that? What are some of the principles um, that we have within our Quaker communities to address some of those patterns? Um, so I'm gonna go first through uh, what are some of the patterns of harm and then build back to the patterns of racial justice. Um, and it's part of, I just wanted to say, it's part of that racial equity principle of knowing yourself. That I think these can be hard for friends to hear. And I think often our um, instinctual reaction can be, um, but we mean well when we are doing these things. And I think it's really important to understand that, yes, I think um, among Quaker communities, often our intent is loving, is beloved community. And it's so important, again, with that know yourself uh, racial equity principle that we recognize when our impact is different than our intent um, and that we think about what accountability for that can look like, what healing can look like. Um, and that we are all engaging in these patterns of harm all the time, that I am doing it as much as anyone else is doing it. Um, and when I was in schools and was leading microaggressions workshops, I would always in those microaggressions workshops talk about my own microaggressions, but then also times that I've had a hard time owning up to them because when we are people who care so much about other people, I think often we're the people who have the hardest time hearing about our impact when it's been harmful. And so recognizing that all of that is fully natural and that our being able to move past that initial discomfort and into the work of healing and into the work of um, accountability is a part of justice in that spirit of 
um, right relationship um, and working toward right relationship and is ultimately always moving us closer to beloved community. So the patterns that we identified, conflict avoidance. Um, so that can look like shutting down dissent. Um, it can look like not wanting to, um, if someone is has said before that you have engaged in something that's harmful, saying, well, I just won't speak anymore um, and feeling like, Having that engagement um, is riskier than doing the work of moving through it. Um, and then sometimes in our communities, we can focus a lot um, on someone who caused harm and not making them feel worse about the harm that they caused and not always paying enough attention to the people who have experienced the harm itself. Um, so that's one of the patterns that um, we identified that has shown up a good bit in Quaker communities. Um, another of the racial wounding examples um, is that Quakers have such a rich history um, and have been on the right side of history so many times um, that it can be hard to be reflective about when that is not the side of history um, that we are on currently. When we are um, sort of relying on that past and missing our blind spots of today. Um, and so again, that invitation to know ourselves is part of um, what this guardians of the status quo is getting at. Um, and that can also look like not recognizing when, when we have more power um, in, in social ways, because of our identities, because of our roles, all of that kind of um, differences that can exist. Um, people not always being aware of how those differences play into how people experience things. And so I think sometimes there can be a sense of um, either that's the way we've always done it. And so that is why um, you shouldn't be hurt by that or, um, just not if if someone speaks up saying I oh I that I don't think they meant that or that shouldn't be um, upsetting to you all sorts of those kinds of layers um, are things that people can experience all the time but that we've noticed in Quaker communities um, is something that we want we're asking people to pay some attention to um, similarly denying that oppression exists within. Um, Quakerism, similar to some of the examples that I gave before, but also adding that um, sometimes this can look like not wanting to um, welcome new people in if they have different cultural expectations, because our sense of what Quakerism is, is um, we feel protective of that. Um, and so thinking about, um, you know, people who want to sing in meeting um, and that that fear that if there's an evolution of that element of um, silent Quakerism, um, particularly in some of our East Coast communities, East Coast Quaker communities, that that is, we're losing Quakerism. If someone sings a song, we're not Quaker anymore. Um, or that, you um, if someone says, here's something that's really important um, to address. One example of this is, um, I've heard from a few meetings about someone who has used the N word during meeting for worship and that people are so afraid of um, engaging around that in any way, because if it is um, a spirit led message and they don't feel like it's their place to engage in that, um, or they will take it to a committee to then have several meetings about it before they respond. Um, and so having the sense of the Quakerism itself is at the center, um, rather than always thinking about the needs of, of the particular community that we are in. Um, and a sense of that there can be, Quakers can um, be so focused on 
the outward appearance of what we are doing. Um, the I, one example of this is I was in a meeting community that had a long, long debate about um, putting a Black Lives Matter sign out front. And the debate was because there were members of the meeting who said, well, I don't know if we're strong enough as a community now that if that attracted people of color, um, that we would be a welcoming space for them. And the people of color were saying, this is really um, important to us. And then other people were saying, well, Quakers don't have signs. And so we can't um, have signs around this. And so a lot of the discussion around what to do, again, was not necessarily listening to um, the needs of that community and about the spirit-led guidance um, of that community, but was more focused on how will it look to others. Um, and then the same um, when there's a uh, one way that we are thinking about um, diversity. So one example of that, again, is people who um, come to a meeting for worship um, who are people of color, and then they are surrounded by um, members of the meeting who are very excited to see them. And they just say, oh, how do you think we can get more people of color without actually getting to know them and get it, you know, having that relational experience? Because the just the idea of that person is, has become more important than um, their their core experience. They're not they're not seen as um, people aren't answering that of God in them, but are seeing something um, external about them. Um, and then inattention to right relationship with time can be sometimes things that feel like they should. Um, be faster if we were listening to spirit, uh, need to go through too many processes, but then um, sometimes there is a sense of um, needing to act really quickly without listening for spirit, and that both of those um, are not in alignment um, with our Quaker principles. And so paying attention to what what's the timing that spirit is calling us to right now. Um, and perfectionism is another aspect of this because sometimes what can slow us down is the sense that it has to be exactly right before we can do whatever the thing is. Um, and so being aware again of what, when is it that that perfectionism is getting in the way of our um, acting in that, um, do, that way that follows divine guidance. And so now we've taken a moment with all of that information. I think I will let us just sit for a moment with that before I play the video of how I think Quaker principles can help. So one moment to just sit with the pain and the challenge um, and the what can feel like frustration of all of the ideas that I just shared. I have been very interested in Tema Okun's work on white supremacy culture and some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture that include aspects like perfectionism, either or kind of binary thinking, one right answer, individualism, urgency. And one of the things that I've noticed is that that is true across my world, <laughs> my life, and it is especially true often in Quaker communities. Antidotes to white supremacy culture, including an openness to multiple perspectives, a slowing down, <laughs> connection to reflection and a commitment to reflection. All of that is reflective of what our Quaker principles are as well. I am Lauren Brownlee, she, her pronouns. I am from Washington, D.C., and I am a member at Bethesda Friends Meeting in Baltimore Yearly Meeting. I believe that Quakers are 
uniquely called from our principles and practices to lean into racial equity principles to engage in the antidotes to white supremacy culture. Many of the Quaker testimonies give us guidance for how we might engage in racial equity work. The testimony of peace, as an example. When I think about the peace testimony, I think about our being open to a range of ways that people engage, a range of beliefs that people might have, a range of worldviews and backgrounds and how we are in community, which is another of the testimonies, together, our peace testimony invites us into an openness. Our testimony of integrity invites us into listening to that of God within us and being integrous in the way that we listen for that voice of the divine and then act from a place of that deep listening. Our community testimony invites us to think about who all is in our community. How do we have expanding, overlapping concentric circles of community? And how are we caring uniquely for each member of our community? How are we answering to that of God in them? Even if it looks different from that of God within us, which it will because we are all unique. And our testimony of community says to us, we are stronger together. When we each have a measure of light, when we each have a measure of truth, when we each have that measure of the divine, then it takes community, it takes listening to everyone in that community to be our best selves, to build that beloved community that I believe we are striving for, that truly is with equity and justice for all. And then when I think about the equity principle, the equality principle, that says to me that we need to understand that our measure of truth, that our measure of light is not greater than the person next to us, that we are answering that of God within them as well. And that we have to hold up those different worldviews, those different perspectives as being just as important, as being just as essential in beloved community building as our own are, even when that feels uncomfortable for us, that that sense of discomfort is often our growing and leaning into that growth, leaning into something that is unfamiliar, that helps us to be stronger as a community. And then finally, stewardship, which we often think of as environmental stewardship, which is very important as well. And when we think about stewardship of communities, when we think about stewardship of relationships, that stewardship is also an invitation for us to be thoughtful about how we are building relationships across our communities, about how we are stewarding these principles and practices that are at the foundation of our Quaker faith. It is important for us to hold on to the fact that white supremacy culture is ever present in Quaker communities and our antidotes are right there present alongside these aspects of white supremacy culture that we encounter. Thank you for watching this episode. So because that focused on um, the testimonies as uh, they are often referred to as the spices, I just wanted to nuance so it a little bit. I have been very interested in there we go. I wanted to nuance it a little bit and um, talk about how um, we we do want to think about Quaker principles beyond the spices. Um, and I will say two things about that. One is that I, in my early days at FCNL, there was a member of our general committee who talked about how we often hear the term Quaker values and that that is um, that can feel very broad and that there are not necessarily um, values that are uniquely Quaker. And this person was encouraging us to think about principles and practices as the language that we use. And it really resonated with me to um, 
think about about what I believe in as principles and practices. Um, and I love that the testimonies are not just these um, spaces that we often hear about of simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship, but that we can think about the things that we witness to in a much broader way. And so this slide is one that I used to share with students when I was um, introducing them to the Quaker identity of the school and would talk about the spaces and then would share this slide to complicate it and say, we don't want you to only understand um, Quaker principles as the spaces and especially this idea from the Black Quaker Project um, that justice uh, is an essential aspect of Quaker principles um, and that it's not in that language of spaces, but that we can't ignore its centrality to what Quakers believe. Um, and then I love this, um, as you can see in the, the text from Black Quaker Project on the left that they talk about spaces with jam and jam being justice and mercy um, and continuing to, to understand that um, the complexities, the complexities that we can bring to this work and that um, the either or thinking or the, um, you know, lines or boxes that we think around, um, that it's always healthy to be thinking about how do we expand our thinking and in this case beyond the uh, spaces. And then a couple others um, that I've already spoken to, the importance of answering that of God in everyone the importance of continuing revelation. I think that has been really essential as I consider how I am called to um, help be the change hey. that to see in the world. Um, and, uh, uh -huh. Um, oh. That continuing uh, revelation and this idea that we don't uh, yet know all of the truth continually revealed to us um, is important in our being able to evolve and to recognize the fact that the that we don't need to be guardians of the status quo, that things might look different and that that's part of our being responsive to divine leadings. Um, and similarly, the idea of way opening, um, that we can have a trust in something greater than us. Um, so those are some of the principles that I have found grounding in the racial justice work that I do, that that I feel are grounded in my Quaker faith and practice. Um, and then some of the practices that support the racial justice work that I am called to. Um, meetings for worship, that space, as I was saying in the Quaker Speak video, to um, get in touch with that of God within us. Um, can be really important in our doing the word work that we are called to do um, and meetings for worship with attention to business that recognizing that when we are doing business as friends that it is in a spirit of worship and to understand that we're not debating that we are not um, in a place of trying to win people over but that we are sharing the truth that we have um, for the benefit of the whole, and then just as equally listening to the truth of others. Um, and that the role of the clerk within Quaker practice can be essential for that, that the role of the clerk is not a top-down leader, but is someone who is guiding the group for that listening to the divine, um, listening in the spirit of corporate discernment, of all of us understanding that we each have different pieces of the truth, um, to find the sense of the meeting, to find what is greater than the truth that any of us might individually bring to it. Um, and then ultimately to seek unity, that we um, are not 
seeking a secular consensus, but that we are looking for a um, divine unity, that it, that it feels sacred, that it feels like we've listened to spirit when we come together around something. Um, and I think that helps in terms of racial justice, because when we are operating in a sense of the loudest voices um, are the ones who get their way, that often does not lead to racial justice. And so this, this idea that we are not listening for who's the loudest, who's the most persistent, who's the most time to um, advocate for something, but that we're listening for something deeper um, can be really important in getting to a truth that really does represent justice. Um, and then also worship sharing spaces, Claremont dialogue, threshing sessions, all of these are different um, Quaker practices, Quaker inspired practices that can um, allow space for all voices. Um, and I think often, again, in secular spaces, it can be the loudest voice who wins and that the idea in Quaker spaces that we really are trying to create equal opportunity for everyone to both share um, and be heard is, is a way that our Quaker practices can lead to more racial justice. And queries, that we are using queries to engage in reflective practices in this sense of continuing revelation that we know that we don't have all the answers um, and that when we are thinking reflectively, when we are coming um, with curiosity and compassion to the situations that we face, that that is gonna help us to be builders of beloved community. And um, next, I wanted to just speak a little bit to practices that are not necessarily Quaker themselves, but that I see a good number of Quaker communities practicing that I think also support um, these Quaker principles. Um, so nonviolent communication, um, the idea of sharing with each other through observations, feelings, needs, and requests. Um, also can be that equalizer um, among people who have different amounts of power or have different kinds of identities. Um, it is also not perfect and there's all sorts of work being done with, with all of these practices about how to um, engage in them with that lens toward equity and um, racial justice, but these are good tools in our toolbox um, for racial justice and that rely on some of the same kinds of practices that we are often practicing as friends. Um, and the next one is restorative practices, same thing. Um, they need to be done with a lens of racial justice and racial equity um, and all kinds of equity, but that they can be really helpful in moving past some of those challenges um, of defensiveness, of um, not being able to recognize when something has happened, that when we take this approach of, it's not that there's someone who's right and there's someone who's wrong, but that there is healing that is needed and we all have a part of that healing. Um, that that is certainly speaking to that community um, testimony of friends and that um, a lot of the practices that we use in Quaker spaces um, give us a good baseline for restorative practices and that the more that we are actively embracing restorative practices within Quaker communities, I think the more we're gonna be able to address um, some of the racial wounding that, that people feel. Um, and then I think there are lots of ways that friends right now are working toward brave space. And I love this poem, Invitation to Brave Space by Mickey Scott Bay Jones, um, that speaks to what we are actively seeking in that, that work um, that can often look like racial justice work or e equity work, um, diversity, sometimes it is called work, but that it's creating brave spaces so that people, when something um, when, when their intent and their impact is not aligned, that they are able to step into that in a way that doesn't feel like it's that binary of right and wrong, but we are working toward um, what can feel braver. Um, and so the poem reads, together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. 
We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify the voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. The space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. And again, I think it's grounded in our Quaker principles of integrity, of community, of equality. Um, and it is a way, it's a, it's a goal, this brave space is a goal for us to be um, approaching our racial justice work through. And a couple of the um, tools for the toolbox of brave space creation are noticing practices and process observation, um, two different ways of doing something similar, which is creating the space for people to speak up when they are feeling wounded um, in the space. But I think often we can um, take that with us and it can fester and get worse. And we feel like we can't be our full selves then. And that the more that we offer opportunities for people in a space to say, here's what was hard about that for me. Here's what hurt me about what, what was said. Um, here's where this doesn't feel aligned for me around the values that I have or that I believe that this community has. Or um, for people to celebrate those moments where there is faithfulness to the community, even in, in hard moments, um, and that we're lifting up those examples for each other. Um, those kinds of noticing practices can be really important for fe people feeling like they can bring their full selves to a space and then that that space can um, be brave because people are allowing it. Um, and then process observation is similar um, and is allowing, particularly at the end of um, some time together to ask how did we do? What was that like um, for us? Were there any observations of ways that we were not aligned um, with our values that we're trying to live into? Are there ways that we um, are observing that we did very well in living into our values? And having that practice of reflection built into the spaces that we are creating, into the communities um, that we share can be really empowering um, for people, especially people who are on the margins in some way and so can be a, a great tool for building racial justice. Um, and so those are some some ideas about how we can be patterns and be examples and walk cheerfully over the earth answering that of God and everyone. Um, but I also want to point to some of the ones that we are suggesting as Quaker Coalition for Operating Racism to address those same patterns um, that we spoke about before. What does racial justice look like with those same patterns? So again, this is the resource on addressing racial wounding and racial justice in Quaker communities. Um, for conflict avoidance, we can practice integrity and accountability that we should, as a community, have some tools to go to. And I just gave some suggestions for what some of those tools can be um, to address conflict that when, when it comes up, it shouldn't be the first time that we're thinking about what do we do when things are hard, that we should have some forward thinking about that. Um, and we should let people know if you are feeling harmed in some way, here's what you can do and how we'll take care of you as a community. Um, and as I was just speaking to with the noticing and the process observation, develop a practice of naming harm and seeking repair, um, and always do that following the lead of those who have felt harmed. Um, when we think about guardians of the status quo, the interventions that we can consider toward racial justice, that we need to be open to change. Um, that transformation is part of our Quaker tradition. Um, that 
what I, I love this quote that I heard um, several years ago from historian Marcia Chatlin, which was, what we need now is a love willing to risk. And I loved that in part because I think it is reflective of our Quaker history and that we need to, in this moment, ask ourselves, what is that love willing to risk? What what does it look like for us to put our values into action in a way that can feel a little bit scary for us, that's pushing us beyond our comfort zones, um, but that in ways that are aligned with our principles um, and that we know is going to be transformative um, in, in the way that we're trying to build the beloved community. Um, and recognizing that answering that of God in everyone means honoring diverse ways of doing things. If someone is suggesting something that is not how we've done it before and the way we've done it before has worked really well for us, understanding that there are many ways that some of these practices can work well. And so being able to be expansive in our thinking in, in some of those ways. Um, and when we think about that denying that oppression exists, some of the interventions toward racial justice include acknowledging power dynamics, um, acknowledging our complicity in, in harms, even when it is, and I would say especially when it is not our intent. Um, and when we start feeling that defensiveness bubble up in us, and I know I feel that um, often if, if I am told that I have done some kind of harm, that that is the beginning. That is a totally natural and appropriate first feeling, but we should not let that be where that ends, that we need to examine that within ourselves. Think about what is underneath what we're hearing. How can, how are we being invited to learn and grow? How do we connect with that of God within us, um, to, to think about what transformation we are being called to? Um, and, and a way of doing that is thinking about feedback as a gift and an expression of love and being grateful when someone tells us how we can love them better. Performativity, um, our interventions toward racial justice can be um, recognizing that um, sometimes we're not going to get it perfect and that we can still move forward. Um, that believing others, even when you don't understand, is an important one there that um, sometimes if someone tells us that they're upset by something and it's not something that would upset us, again, that's the beginning of the story and that we have more work to do to listen um, and to understand and to, to do that heart listening that, that can be transformative for us. And listening, especially for spirit. <laughs> Where is spirit showing up in the work? that we are doing and how do we get out of our own heads um, and into that deeper place within us as individuals and as a community. Um, and thinking about where are the places that we are naturally drawn to um, want to have control of something, not having control is scary. Um, so this work of racial justice is calling us to brave space and to be brave within ourselves, finding that brave space spiritually um, and acting on it. And then always um, thinking about how are we centering our relationships? How are we answering that of God within each other? Um, and as we think about how to um, intervene toward racial justice when it comes to inattention to right relationship with time, understanding that the spiritual health of the community is the most important business of any Quaker body. Spiritual bodies that are wrestling with their internalized racism have deeper relationships, trust, and are better suited for deepening their relationship with the divine. Um, and recognizing that um, I think what can sometimes happen is that we have a really clear agenda and especially um, when we're anxious about something or if we're new to clerking or to a space that we can be really focused on how do we center what has been decided on this agenda um, and recognizing that God or spirit's time is not decided by the clock or the calendar, the agenda that was created yesterday or last week, but is um, our listening to what is needed right in this moment. Um, and so, in closing, um, two thoughts for you. One is, 
I love this quote from um, poet Elizabeth Alexander, the beloved community requires that love is demanding, connecting, activating. So when we think about that beloved community that friends communities are so often trying to build, um, understanding that it's work it is um, joyful work often, but it is also um, challenging work. And so thinking about how we are willing to give ourselves over to that and that, um, when we want to know that there can be a world grounded in love, that there can be a beloved community, it's our responsibility to build it. Um, and so we believe that there is good in the world when we are that good in the world, when we know that we are acting on our own principles um, in how we show up and that our Quaker principles are such a great foundation for that. So again, I am calling you to be patterns, be examples, to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of God in everyone. And I'm closing with the quote from Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I um, will leave you with the queries, what aspects of racial justice work make you come alive? And what aspects of racial justice work enliven Quaker communities building the world we seek? Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. <laughs> I now invite members to sit with that for a moment and uh, use the raise your hand icon down there. If you want to say something, just feel free to ask a question, make a comment, whatever the spirit leads you, feel free to speak. Go ahead, Gretchen. I just want to say thank you, Lauren, so much for helping us enter that brave space. It's uh, it's remarkable that challenge to be open in such a loving way. And um, I'm just remembering Adria Galizia's talk from last year was uh, encouraging the same. Uh, with lots of ideas of the ways we do things, just we don't have to do it that way. We can do it in radically different ways. We Our meetings can function in, in new and creative ways that are much more welcoming. Um, but what I'm really focused on from your talk just now, Lauren, is that idea that uh, a reaction or a, a, an idea or a sense of something is only the first motion, you know, love is the first motion, but it's only the first bit of a continuing conversation. And I think that's a fascinating idea because sometimes we feel something and we just put it into a category or we, you know, isolate it somehow. But uh, for me, that's very invitational uh, to continue or to broaden the conversation. So I wonder if you could say a little more about that idea of it's just the first motion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think that there's a connection between that and our continuing revelation and that um, our first feeling, our first thought um, in, in our Quaker beliefs, we understand that truth is continually revealed. 
and that the truth that we might feel in that moment is not necessarily a lasting truth with a capital T. And so being able to um, call ourselves in, <laughs> in those moments and be really gentle with ourselves and have a lot of grace. And that is, I would say, the thing that I have learned the most is um, in practicing this work is that I can feel really frustrated with myself if I don't act exactly as I would hope to in a moment. Um, and that my beating myself up about it does not do me or anyone else any good, but my um, being able to hold that feeling of disappointment with tenderness, but then thinking about what comes next, <laughs> how do I live into my principles, um, I think can be important. And I think too of, um, I heard a talk by Howard Stevenson, um, who's Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy, his brother, who is a um, professor. And he was talking about um, with microaggressions, when we think about speaking up um, about microaggressions, that there's been research done that um, when we don't speak up, but we think about what we would say, that we're more likely to then speak up the next time. And so thinking about that first time as a practice run, you know, it's not, I failed myself, I didn't live into my values, but this is an opportunity for me to reflect and to learn and to grow. Um, and that that learning and growing is part of the process for me as I would want it to be the process for anyone else. And I think often we're much, we, we are able to give much more grace to other people, but thinking about, um, yeah, what, what we would want, um, for others or from others in those moments and, um, using, using those hard times as, as practice. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I think tenderness, um, and grace are the name of the game with all of this work. Juliana. Thank you so much, Lauren, for your presentation. As I was looking at the challenges that you laid out that are particular for Quaker communities, um, well, it one, it struck me as like quite true. Um, and um, it was nice to see them all uh, collated. So if you can share that, I would love that. Um, but the second thing that kind of struck me about that list is that some of them seem to be like shadow sides of the um, testimonies, like the testimony of equality that then gets, you know, sort of like distorted to not address power dynamics or the testimony of peace that gets distorted to do conflict avoidance. Um, and have I'm wondering if, you have, what are ways that we can talk about like, um, because then that sort of like baptizes the practice. That's not a very good Quaker metaphor, but it like sort of baptizes the challenges. Like, well, we don't do that because, you know, we have a testimony of peace. Um, and how do you, how do you help people? How have you run into that, that the challenges are like, people double down on them. I'm curious. And then I'm curious as to how you move past that. That is a great question and a great observation. Um, and I think absolutely that that is part of what is so hard about moving um, through a lot of these. Um, and I think to me, it is uh, that commitment to continuing revelation that the way that we understand that testimony or have understood that principle or testimony um, may need to evolve. Um, and 
listening to each other about how it may need to evolve. Um, and I think one of the things that I always say um, is important is that I also don't have the right answers. You know, that my in the article that Alicia and I wrote, um, we said, you know, just as there's no easy answer, um, that that looking for easy answers is part of, you know, what can present as white supremacy culture, that we're also not saying that Quaker principles and practices are that easy answer either, um, that we have to um, have intention and integrity um, around how we are holding them. And I think that the more that we can be in that sense of we are wiser together and um, how are we listening to, to spirit together, to truth together, um, and using that to guide our discernment about how we are led, um, that is honestly what, what I have seen work is often when people are able to get out of a defensiveness I think again it, it can be some um there can be some reactionary responses of no no but this is why or you know um people I, I just think Quakers especially so often have positive intent that it can be just so important to say I am not saying you are wrong or bad <laughs> I am inviting you um to think about this in a more expansive way. Um, and that I will also be thinking about this in an expansive way. And I am not saying to you, I am the person who is giving you the answers, but let's let's be in this challenge together. Um, and I think people are often when um and I don't I don't think this is ideal in, you know, in our in our beloved community, we don't have to pay as much attention to I understand your intentions are positive. But right now, I think people are um, much more open to engaging in that transformation when they feel safe, when we are doing that active work of brave space creation, um, that that foundation um, sort of lowers people's defenses and then I think can lead to more transformation. And I will put the slides in the... Um, chat because there are a good number of links in my slides <laughs> so there's there are more of those resources um several places in the presentation stephanie thank you brown um well and and related to that uh Lauren, I have the feeling that I've just come away from the Thanksgiving table and I'm kind of waddling and staggering. And uh, I was thinking that practically each one of the slides could be the basis for uh, an hour of uh, religious education class for um, pondering and discussion and um, yeah, thank you for something that's very full and bears so much uh, fruit to it. I would hope that we can be good stewards of, of the richness of the feast that you have shared with us. Thank you so much. And I do get that every time of there's so much <laughs> more that is to be explored about all of these things. And it's, um, it led to, uh, we, Zenaida uh, Pearson, who helped write the guide to racial wounding and racial um, justice in Quaker communities with me and I, we did a Pendle Hill first Monday lecture on those um, in January. And people said after that, but we just want to have a whole time with just one of the principles and spend an hour and a half just on one and unpack that and think about all of that. And so Pendle Hill um, ended up integrating that into the 
Quaker Institute that they are having in May. Um, and we will take one of them and do a 90 minute deep dive and then also have a workshop for people to think about with the whole um, guide, how to integrate that into people's um, Quaker communities and practices. And um, one of the things that, that I was sharing some space recently is that in the Quaker Coalition for Uprooting Racism steering committee meetings each month, um, we allow space for us to process how have we used the guide in the last month? How do we see ways to use the guide moving forward? But then also where are we seeing these patterns? Um, so it's um, something that we are actively engaging with uh, regularly ourselves <laughs> as we are um, sharing it more broadly. Jaina, all the way from space. Hi, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I just wanted to really thank you for um, raising the idea of how a lot of times, or, or a common reaction for Quakers is to say, well, I'll just shut up or I'll just withdraw and not engage with this. Um, and it's one of those moments when it's like, I noticed that in other people. And then I was sitting here thinking like, oh, now I'm noticing it in myself. Uh, there's some work that I have been doing where I've just felt like no matter what I do, there's going to be people unhappy. And there's been this piece of me that's like, oh, I just want to like uh, resign from that. Like, I don't want to be involved in that. And I think you've kind of encouraged me to keep keep involved with that and and just keep trying to do my best knowing that there are going to be mistakes that are made and I'm going to make mistakes and um but it doesn't mean to give up on it so thank you very much thank you and I will say working at FCNL one of my favorite examples of that is um our ceasefire work and that anything that you say about Israel, Palestine um, is going to upset someone. And we sort of have to embrace, there's not a perfect thing to say. We're never going to find the perfect thing to say that makes everyone feel like we're on the right side of history. So we have to say what feels right to us and be open to hearing feedback and to evolving that. And we have evolved it um, as we listen deeply, but that if we were, you know, waiting to not mess up at all, we would never act. <laughs> and I think that is true for all of us in so many ways, all of the time. And um, that that willingness to embrace and learn from mistakes and not try to um, be having the standard be perfection. <laughs> and um, I think for for me too, um, that that often feels like something that I have to work on. And I was saying with one of my friends um, last week that particularly as a black woman who has been relatively successful in my career, that that has happened in part because I have had this really high standard <laughs> and that my needing to work to unlearn that and unlearn the ways that that, you know, what that puts into the world for other people when I'm always um, working to this standard level um, expectation um, that that is something that I have to unpack and that is not a part of my beloved community building to, um, you know, work to the point of exhaustion all the time. Um, and that I think it's similar to what Quaker communities experience of what we've done has really worked for us. <laughs> and so we want to keep doing it. And when people ask us to do something different, it feels hard um, and challenging. And we know that what we did before worked and that in my own life with this perfectionism, I have to say, I know that what I was doing worked and I know it's not, that's not the world I want to live in. And so if I want to um, be a builder of that world I want to live in, I, I have to keep practicing it, even if it is different than what um, I have found worked in the past. Uh, Lauren, uh
I try not to ask questions, but this really came to me while you're speaking. And I wonder if you have any um, wisdom to share. You've spoken a lot about um, grace and tenderness that we, we, we share with each other and, and extend to one another. You've spoken about all of us being different pieces of the truth. And uh, you've also talked about um, some of the fear that exists amongst us. And I'll just, you, you, you gave an example of um, a vocal ministry in worship that really didn't come out clearly and somebody using the N word. So I'm just wondering how do we balance between all these, like all of us being pieces of the truth, extending grace and tenderness to each other, but again, realizing the fact that sometimes the vocal ministry in open worship or in meetings for worship might not be communicating the voice of the togetherness. So how do we balance between being pieces, each of us being a piece of the truth, extending grace and tenderness to others, even when we feel uncomfortable with the vocal ministry that they're bringing in worship? That is a great question um, and not an easy answer. Um, and again, for me, it comes from a place of um, sharing my truth about something, my experience of it, um, and not saying, I, in, in my approach, I will never say you are wrong for this. I say, here's the impact of what, um, just happened. And I might ask a question like, um, you know, have you thought about um, how to really be in touch with um, what what is coming from that divine place? And what does that look like? What does that process look like for you? Here's what it looks like for me. Um, and to do it in a way that feels um, as connective as possible so that it is not, um, again, that we're on opposite sides of a right or wrong, but that I am sharing my experience, my truth, my um, principles, how how my principles might connect to, to the moment. Um, and then trying to do that with curiosity and compassion. I think when a whole community is suffering from something, I think then it's the community's responsibility to um, engage in that way in a more corporate way. And I think if there is someone who um, is engaging in that, you know, is, is having those conversations and comes out um, of those conversations and continues to do harm, um, then I think those are moments to say, there are boundaries to be drawn. Um, and I, I've recently had this experience of um, having to think about when is someone's harm to a community um, in, in an FCNL context, when is someone's harm to a community such that we have to say, we need you to do some work outside of this community in order for you to help create um, the kind of brave space, beloved community we are working for here. And right now, um, the balance of it is that that you're harming a lot of other people and that we've talked to you about it and worked with you and tried the um, nonviolent communication and the restorative practices. And when those are the tools that we have and they're not, they're, you're, you're still engaging in harm, um, that we have to, at that point, lovingly draw a boundary. And we still... Um, see the light in you we still um you know honor your humanity and there needs to be a shared understanding of how we create the brave space together how we create beloved community together um so i think it is a i think there are ways to do that as a both and thank you i think that there's a, a question in the chat from jim Oh, Adriel raised her question, her hand as well. But Jim is asking <clears throat> if you have any thoughts about those practices in this context. I mean, the weighty Quakers or endearing elder, 
eldering yeah go ahead um yeah i i my core thought is that um i think as a quaker community or i guess the quaker communities that i am a part of need i think more of a grounding in eldering um to understand how that can be uh how how eldering can happen in a spirit guided way um i think sometimes again in in my experience of quaker communities it can feel more um from some positional power or from um someone who feels like they're who has sort of granted themselves authority um and so i think having the clarity about what is the spiritual um grounding of of eldering that happens and i do think um weighty quakers um can often be folks who are who who a community recognizes as having that spiritual grounding and can often do um eldering with the capital e in a way that does feel um like like it does have that um groundedness in spirit um but I, I think it I think people need to to really understand the practice of eldering um and that it can often be used I, I guess I would say it can often be weaponized um and that it can uh, veer away from the the principles that we try to ground our community in um and just a little bit more on clerking um I love clerking. I think clerking um, as a way of helping to hold a community, helping to hold um, that brave space, that beloved community building, um, thinking about how to root an experience in the kinds of principles that I have been talking about, um, how to um, between meetings, how to how to do the work to get the community ready to take um, the steps that feel like they are coming from spirit. Um, one relatively quick story that I will tell is um, when I was head of upper school at Carolina Friend School during the pandemic, um, Carolina Friend School's interpretation of Quaker process um, was that everyone on upper school staff would get to make the decision about when and how we came back to campus. Um, and so we were trying to make this, you know, 35 person decision about um, th these just really weighty issues that we did not all have equal access to information about. Um, and it was a really painful uh, time in our community. And it, at some point, um, after many, many meetings about it, um, it became clear that we were moving toward a sense of the group around um, coming to campus for classes a couple days a week in the next term. Um, and then when I tested that with the group and said, you know, this is my sense of where we are as a group, uh, I want to test that. And people said, yeah, we think we're ready to move forward in that way. Um, and then as we moved forward, um, I, someone said, I, I just want to be noted as standing aside. And then I think maybe five more people said, me too, me too, me too. And I said, friends, normally we would not move forward if there are this many people who are standing aside with a decision. And so, you know, help help me think about this. Where, where are we really um, and the people who were standing aside said, no, we really do feel like that is the sense of the group. Um, and we don't want to hold the group back from, from moving in that way. But we do continue to have these concerns around um, that we get to go back to campus because we have the spacious campus and a lot of public school students in the area don't get to have that. And we have these concerns about um, COVID affecting people of color more than it is affecting white people right now. And um, all of these layers of their concerns that were so um, principled. And we ended up 
in that meeting, deciding, um, committing to write a minute um, as a staff that would go out with the decision that we were sending to families about um, opening up the campus two days a week um, to also talk about, it was a minute on privilege. And this is what we're recognizing about the privilege that we have to do this. Um, these are the queries that we are going to be living into in this next term around this privilege that we have. Um, and that we as a staff committed to regularly talk about those queries. So we both said, you know, this is what as a community we want to be holding, but then we also modeled, we're going to keep coming back to this and holding these concerns. Um, and that it was such a model for people. There were a lot of people on staff who were relatively new to Quaker process, but that idea of um, that there aren't winners and losers, that we're really looking for what we can do that holds everyone's needs, um, that holds the truth that everyone is bringing to this decision. Um, and that, to me, is, you know, when you're clerking, that's what you're trying to hold is how how do I hold everyone's um, needs and the diverse ways that they show up and being on the lookout for them and all different kinds of signals that you're um, getting. So I think clerking can be so important to that um, sense of racial justice within within Quaker practice. Thank you. Edra? It's good to see you, by the way. It's, it's great to see you and it's great to see you, Lauren. Um, Lauren and I were in the same group at last year's Quaker Institute and I am so bummed I will not be able to make it this year, but you should all go. Um, um, so I have to, to, to echo what's been said. Thank you so much for this. And I already have a list of people that I'm going to be sending this talk to um, as soon as the, the recording is made available. Um, and I have to echo what Stephanie said that, uh, that there's so much, there's so much here. So I have a little bit of preamble and then uh, a, a question, but I'm going to try to be brief because there is so much. So one thing that came up as you were speaking and as folks have been sharing is um, have been sharing their, their thoughts and reactions is Nietzsche's definition of decadence, that uh, decadence is, the is a state when life no longer resides in the whole. And it strikes me that one of our problems perhaps as friends is that our vision is, is splintered. You know, the whole incomplete Quaker life is grounded in the spirit and, and everything comes together as one. But when we don't have that whole vision and our vision is splintered or fragmented, we wind up in situations like what Juliana said, uh, you know, the peace testimony means we can't confront each other. But of course, a peace that's grounded in the spirit can't come at the expense of integrity. Or what you said about working yourself to exhaustion, Lauren, you know, um, satisfaction and delight in a job well done is part of the gift of creation. But creativity grounded in the spirit is going to honor our humanity and the humanity of others. And so um, one of the challenges that I've had, and I would love your thoughts on it, is that the same is that you sometimes see people pushing back against um, the, the work for racial justice because in this splintered, fragmented vision of what it means to be a friend, they see that in um, work for racial justice as a threat. But sometimes I see the same energy coming from the other side. And so people will say, well, um, eldering can be used to ratify power dynamics. So we need to know what we need to get rid of eldering. Corporate discernment can be used to uh, stifle prophetic voices. So we need to get rid of uh, corporate discernment. Um, gospel order ratifies, uh, you know, privilege. And so we need to do circles instead, or we need to get rid of gospel order. And so just the same way that people defending this splintered, fragmented, idolatrous view of Quakerism, see racial justice work as the enemy, sometimes people working for racial justice see this distorted version of the Quaker faith and say, well, then we need to get rid of Quakerism. And so um, I don't even know what the question is, except help, help us, Lauren, help us all. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> well, Adria, I will say you were such a help to me last year at the Quaker Institute that being in community with you was such a gift. Um, and I 
had learned from you from reading some of what you have written before, but being in that community with you was just powerful, transformative, all of the good things. <laughs> um, and I think to me, it all goes back to that, that none of us have the right answers that we, there are, that when, when you think of the answers as binaries, that there is a right and a wrong, and that this whole aspect is going to be wrong. And so we need to um, get rid of it. I, I think approaching um, all of the discernment that we're doing about the way forward with the sense of um, that we're listening to each other for our truths and that we are um, finding that way together that meets all of our needs, as I was just talking about with the clerking, um, that we probably don't have a lot of the, you know, the picture, what it looks, what, what excellent eldering consistently looks like. But that doesn't mean that all of um, eldering needs to be thrown out. It means that we need to look at those practices and say, what what is it that we are feeling is the truth of this practice? And what does it look like for this um, practice to benefit from continuing revelation? What is the new truth that we have? What is our new um, lived experience as we become a more diverse um, society of friends that that this needs to, to shift? Um, and I think one of the other things that I love about Quaker, the Quaker faith, is that we accept that not all communities need to look exactly the same. Um, and that was um, one of the gifts that I got from you last year, too, is recognizing the the Society of Friends is so diverse in the, the ways that we, um, how we see our faith um, and what is most important to us. And I think um, FCNL has been a great gift to me as well around that and the different experiences of friends and being able to um, benefit from the gifts that all of those that that, that diversity brings to us. Um, and I had never been to a programmed um, meeting and the clerk of FCNL's general committee um, is someone who leads a programmed meeting and invited me to come to it via Zoom. And it was amazing. And it was such a, um, I think it demystified something that to me, you know, I thought how, if so much of the importance of my Quaker faith is that I worship in silence and that that, you know, when when you go to a Quaker school, that's what they tell you, you know, on, on the East Coast, that's what they tell you. Um, that Quakerism is, is you worship in silence. And so then opening up this world of there's more than this one way to be Quaker and that there can be people that I love whose experience of Quakerism is different than mine and that I benefit from it and that they can reflect back to me how you know they see my light and the, how they grow from their engagement in, in my experience of Quakerism. Um, I think to me, that's the answer is to continue to engage in that kind of deep listening to each other and to listen for the deeper truths that are not just, um, you know, what can feel like is the fast answer in our head <laughs> to really try to root down in spirit. Thank you, Lauren. I I think we will stop at that. I just want to invite uh, Della for uh, one quick follow-up question, and then I'll finish with Gretchen, who will close it up for us. Della? Well, I just want to announce that a week from today, we will be having a follow-up conversation to begin to think more about how the things we've heard in the last two Quaker lectures um, make a difference in the life of our meetings and churches. And we're so grateful that Adria is going to facilitate that for us. This is actually, that piece will actually be a program of the Quaker Leadership Center. And I am putting in the chat, the link to the Quaker Leadership Center, 
we're still a relatively new uh, ministry of Earlham School of Religion, and we are here to help anybody who who accepts responsibility in their meeting. That's how we define leaders at this point. It doesn't mean that there aren't other kinds of leaders, but that's how we describe who the folks that we serve right now. So, so I do invite you to that, and uh, the link is in the chat. And uh, thank you for, I thank you, Adria, for being willing to uh, to lead this, and uh, thank you, Lauren, for this evening. This was really wonderful. I've heard your name for quite a while, and and. Uh, have appreciated a wonderful working relationship with Alicia McBride. So I, it's like, oh, the two of you together, I can see how that's di very dynamic. <laughs> thank you, Della. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this has been wonderful, and I hope you enjoyed it. The recording will be on our web, on our YouTube channel. I'll send out the link to everybody that registered. Gretchen? Thank you, Brown, and thank you for bringing us together tonight and, and holding our space together. And Lauren, thank you. As so many have said, we just really, really treasure um, this evening with you. Thank you for your presence and your thoughtfulness and your faithfulness. Let us pray together. Oh, gracious God, we come with such full hearts we are grateful for the ways in which you've opened us and opened our minds and our hearts. We're grateful for Lauren's leadership in the Quaker world. We are grateful for this evening. Help us to use this knowledge to create brave spaces and to go forward with newness, a new sense of possibility, of things that can happen in ways we hadn't imagined. And that's how God works. That's how you work through us, oh God, and we are grateful for that. And so for this time, for this space, for each other, and for the spaces between us that we know you bless. We say tonight, thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.